Well, welcome everyone back and thank you once again for your patience. I am very happy to introduce Klaus Kiefer, who is a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Cologne. Uh, he's working primarily on gravitational physics, quantum gravity, astrophysics, cosmology, uh, but also the foundations of quantum mechanics, the coherence, and um, related issues. He has won in 2008 a second prize in the <laughs> FQXI essay contest with his essay on the, uh, the, the fate of time in quantum gravity. And uh, he's done some time ago the PhD in physics in Heidelberg, working with Dietrich Zell. And I suspect that maybe the work here is in some continuation of, of, of uh, work that uh, Dietrich Zell has done also, or some connection. We'll see. There will be there. Yes, some connection is uh, there. Mm -hmm. After Heidelberg, before Cologne, he's been in Zurich and in, in Freiburg, and has been a visiting professor in many places, Cambridge, Tours, Berlin. Montpellier and Tours, yeah, yes. in France. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy to have him here. He will be talking about the origin of irreversibility in the universe, please. Yeah, so thank you very much, Chris, for this very kind introduction and the kind invitation uh, yeah. to come to Geneva. I have given a talk in Geneva before. I think it was around 91 or 92 when I was postdoc in Zurich at the Physics Institute, which is somewhere else. But I'm certainly happy to be here again in this uh, nice place. So yeah, in my talk, Origin of Irreversibility in the Universe, it's about time. And okay, this is the Beyond Space Time series and Beyond Space Time will play a particular role here. So you will see something beyond space time in order to understand time. Yeah, oops. So the buttons do not work here. Okay. So now, okay. So I have uh, three parts. So, first, uh, the issue of the direction of time or the issue about the irreversibility. What is the problem of the direction of time? And uh, I will argue that the origin of this direction of time actually comes from a more fundamental theory, which is quantum gravity. Now, quantum gravity is not yet in a final stage, but we have approaches to quantum gravity. And I will pick one of those to explain how, at least in principle, I imagine that time and its direction can be recovered. And this will be the third part, arrow of time from quantum cosmology. Now, okay, irreversibility is, of course, deeply rooted, not only in physics, but in our everyday life here. It's a painting from Paul Cézanne, Nature Mordo Crane, where you see this irreversible aspect of the world, the, the passage of time ne, from the past uh, to the future, and uh, you will see the second law ne, in action. And uh, this is here, this overview, arrows of time. Now, what's the problem? Why is this a problem at all? You may say, okay, uh, there is this irreversibility and this is a fundamental structure and how should I explain it? Now, the point is that, that all the fundamental law, there's an except, exception which is not important from the weak interactions, but apart from that, all the fundamental laws of nature, they are time symmetric. That means if you go, they typically have a T in it no? and, and, and a parameter. If you have T in minus T instead of T, um, the laws are more, more or less the same. So you would expect um, also this reversibility in the structure of the world, but it's not like that. No? As uh, illustrated in Paul Cézanne's uh, painting, there are classes of uh, phenomena in nature um, that exhibit um, an arrow of time, a clear distinction between the past and the future. And uh, there are many, many cases, so the radiation case, which you know, um, particularly from electrodynamics, um, Maxwell's equations are time symmetric. But um, you have therefore solutions that can be described by so-called advanced and others that can be described by retarded solutions. Usually we um, denounce the um, advanced ones as unphysical because they 
they violate our concept of causality and only use the retarded. Um, in the case of, say, just water waves, if you throw a stone into the water, then you will have outgoing waves. But there's also a solution where outgoing waves uh, are ingoing and throw the stone out of the water. I mean, this is a equally valid solution of the wave equation and electrodynamics they have the same because it's a second order equation. Now you don't observe, of course, the stone being thrown out of the water. I think uh, if you go here to the lake, um, you will not see that. Yeah. So um, next is thermodynamics. Uh, we heard a little bit about thermodynamics in the previous talk, um, no, at the beginning of your, of, your, of your talk. So the increase of entropy. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, is the most famous manifestation of the error of time, because it's the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy increases. I will come to that. Quantum theory, uh, the Schrodinger equation is also time symmetric, um, but the measurement processes and the emergence of classicality are not. So um, how come? And finally, we have gravity. Gravity. Uh, you have the expansion of the universe, which gives you a, a, a direct um, arrow in a sense, um, but also the formation of structure, which is because of the attractive nature of gravity, the collapse no, to, to, to form object and the most extreme case, um, the black holes. So uh, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington was probably the first who uh, discussed this clearly and to my knowledge, he introduced this notion arrow of time, no? flash du temps, um, type file, which we have also been used in other languages. And of course, uh, your, uh, there's the issue of whether these are just different cases and we have to just discuss them separately or we can have a reduction and uh, find a master arrow of time that is behind those. And this is also what, what I would like to argue here, that there is a master of arrow, a master for the arrow of master arrow of time. Um, and it is actually found in gravity, gravitational physics. Um, now, a bit more details about uh, all of these. So one slide for all of these arrows of radiation, I already said in words, but those of you who know about Maxwell equations, um, they know about the so-called vector potential A mu, and we have this wave equation. No? So, um, so where you have uh, D'Alembert A mu is 4 pi C A mu in the standard notation. And then so you have a wave equation, and you can write a solution of this uh, in two ways. No? Well, it, it, you can write it as a source term, which is, comes from here. Electron and, and a boundary term. And in physics, in, we have differential equations, so you always need some boundary or initial conditions. So you can write this, um, this just textbook, as sum of the retarded potential plus, in, plus an initial condition, or as the sum of the advanced potential plus an outgoing. So the fact that we usually only use the retarded potential, or that's only consistent to use the retarded potential, means in this notation that why the question why is this zero but not this no, because this is a mathematical identity here but uh, uh, usually you have worked with this so this is zero so why is this at least approximately zero and this is of course a question for an initial condition this is the ingoing part of the electromagnetic radiation and uh, well, if you see this in the cosmological context it means that we don't have here a lot of incoming radiation from the early universe. I mean, there is some radiation. It's from the cosmic microwave background, which is 3 Kelvin, but this is not important here in this room, for example. You know, so here, we uh, to understand this, in my opinion, we have to go to cosmology. Now, this was um, discussed already long ago. In fact, Einstein and Ritz discussed this here in Switzerland. Uh, in 1909, and uh, so Ritz came up with the suggestion that this is actually the master error of time, and that thermodynamics follows from this. Um, whereas Einstein's view was just the opposite. He 
thought thermodynamics is much more fundamental and this can be derived from thermodynamics by having a dust cloud and then you have okay with the incoming radiation or not incoming radiation you have then um, a thermodynamic e equilibrium with um, with more or less radiation and uh, so they could not solve their discrepancy so they just ended their paper with these words so that's the English translation, of course, of the German original. So Ritz considers the restriction to the form of the retarded potentials as one of the roots of the second law, while Einstein believes that the irreversibility is exclusively based on reasons of probabilities. Now, today, the opinion is that Einstein is correct and that um, we have to base it on, on, on the, this on the second law of thermodynamics between the two. Now, this is thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics in standard notation, the increase of entropy for closed systems. So the S over the T is the part that comes from the exchange uh, with the external system, and then the internal part if there's no ex external. And so okay, this is when you have heat um, being exchanged. Of can you can lower or you can increase the entropy of the system. Um, now, for example, in the fridge, which works because you transfer entropy from the inside to the outside. Um, but if this is zero, then the second law states that this is uh, non-decreasing. Non and, okay, this was already known from the mid of the 19th century, but the issue arose when Boltzmann came up with a statistical foundation, because the statistical foundation means that you base this on microscopic laws at that time of mechanics, and they were reversible. So it, it, it went in, if, if, if something went in this direction, it also went in this direction. So if, say, the molecules um, started in one corner and spread around, then at some time, then they could also spread here, uh, they, they can um, collect here, so really on, in that corner, right? That's also a solution. And uh, so what about the statistical foundation? Well, there were, of course, people who strongly objected Boltzmann. I mean, as you know, Boltzmann did not have a, or had a hard time with his opponents. And um, so Lohr Schmidt, he had his Umkehr Einwand, his reversibility objection. Well, what I just said in words, that if um, you have something with increase of entropy, so molecules spread around here, you could also have the same solution, molecules go back again, a decrease of entropy. And, Zermelo's Wiederkehreinwand, um, recurrence objection, based on a theorem by uh, Henri Boncaré, who said that, uh, had proved that, I mean, every ergodic system uh, in a finite time reached, comes arbitrarily close to its, in, its initial state. So if you have an initial state of low entropy, if you wait long enough, you will come back to this initial state arbitrarily close. And this is not what we see. Um, okay, today, I just said already right now, um, uh, we know that this is correct, but the time scales involved are so huge um, that we will not see this. You know? So these are typically double exponentials. Uh, so something like if you do that, say have here the gas molecules in the corner, how long does it take for them to assemble back then? This is typically something like ten to the ten uh, to the ten years, you know, right? So not not like ten to the ten years. So given the um, uh, finite or relatively small age of the universe, with ten to the ten years, ten to the ten to the ten is irrelevant for our world. Yeah, and you will not wait here ten to the ten to the ten years to see that. So what is the solution to that? And also the solution to this Umkehrmann is, okay, you need special boundary conditions because if you start with some initial state of low entropy, then of course, by statistical reasoning, you have an increase of entropy and the uh, recurrence is negligible. Quantum theory, the Schrodinger equation is time reversal invariant. Well, the Schrodinger equation to uh, remind you is of that form. And uh, okay, you can... Replace this by minus t if you replace this by minus i if you if you do the complex conjugate, but this um has to have psi to psi star psi star at least concerning um transition amplitudes and, and the like. This does not affect. So this is uh, reverse invariant, 
But the measurement process, if you make a measurement, um, has a direction of time, a certain measurement result out of a superposition of many. And uh, okay, there's a huge debut and subject of my talk is not the interpretation of quantum mechanics. This would be a separate talk, um, but still I have to mention it here. So either you just stick to the standard formalism, then you have all these components still there and the branching in so-called Everett components, or you invoke a so-called dynamical collapse of the wave function that spoils this uh, irreversibility. And going from all these uh, components, say Schrodinger cat being uh, simultaneously dead and alive to being dead or alive. I mean, the transition from the end to the or, no, you can reach that. Uh, this increasing entanglement also leads to a process called decoherence. That's the connection with Dieter C that, that you mentioned. So someone did his PhD in the 80s, um, namely the irreversible emergence of classical properties through the interaction with the environment. So if you have a, if you have a special initial condition um, and you have a superposition such as Schrodinger cat, and um, then the interaction with the environment irreversibly will lead to the um, emergence of a classical property. So at least even if you don't have a real collapse, you can have an apparent collapse at that at that level that um, from because of the coherence, the cat does look dead or alive, even if there's an entanglement in a full system with an, with an environment, but this you cannot access. Yeah? This is the our molecules that scatter off and go away. Um, yeah, so usually we describe entropy increase by we are coarse graining or neglect of irrelevant decrease of freedom, transformation of relevant information about macroscopic differences into irrelevant information. And what is irrelevant? Well, pure microscopic differences that on the at the macroscopic level have no effect. Well, a classic example by Gibbs um, is this ink top. Analogy that I could do here in an experiment. Yeah, so having a drop of ink here in my water, this is a state of low entropy because you have all the information where the ink is, and then you steer, and then of course uh, it looks uh, like equally distributed. Yeah, with this, this, this high entropy, and this is the coarse graining. But if you looked microscopically, then you would just see many filaments. Yeah, so the entropy in principle is at a fundamental exact level conserved, but at that coarse grained level, it increases no? because it looks child like uh, more probable to have the ink everywhere, although microscopically, it's just uh, filaments. Um, yeah, this is the standard formula for Neumann formula that we use. Um, for those who know, I mean, if you have an open system in quantum theory, we have a so-called density operator row instead of the wave function and we have this formula, minus Boltzmann, con con minus Boltzmann concentrates rho log rho that we usually apply. So if this um, rho would correspond to a full pure state, then it would just be zero. A full pure quantum state has all the information in it. According to quantum mechanics, there's no lack of information. And so entropy is zero if we interpret entropy as um, lack of information. But if you have, say, an entangled state, so like in the einstein podolsky rosen case here, correlated to another particle, and you, if you trace out the other particle, because it, it's far away, you cannot see it, then you have a, a row for the for your particle, and this has then an, an, a positive entanglement, or verschränkungs, as Schrödinger called it, verschränkungs entropy, entanglement entropy. Now, of course, the question for the arrow of time, of course, is why we are so far from from away from a thermodynamic equilibrium of of arbitrary large entropy. I mean, just for probability arguments, we would expect that in the world entropy is very large because it's just many more um, 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 realizations no? than a very particular state where you have here. Uh, all this structure and we're sitting here with our brains and so on, very ordered system. This is, of course, the question of the initial condition. And it's actually um, not a new discussion. I mean, Ludwig Boltzmann, in my opinion, was the first who pointed to cosmology as the possible root of um, the second law. Now, 
um, having not a thermal equilibrium, what we have here, we have, say, the sun as a very localized hot spot, and maybe the other stars, but in between there is just empty space, so where you can radiate your photons to, so which has entropy capacity, no? far away from equilibrium. So the question is, where does the sun and where does, do the stars come from? Well, we know they come from gravitational instability of dust clouds, and this is, of course, a cosmological question. I mean, to understand that, you have to discuss the early universe and all that. Where do these structures come from? Now, in Boltzmann's days, of course, there was not yet an idea of an evolving universe, Big Bang, and all that. Uh, the universe was, was thought to be static and eternally old. You know? So how can you have an initial condition, say, of low entropy in our universe? Well, Boltzmann, in his uh, nature paper published in Nature, the, the journal Nature, he wrote that in nature, the transition from a probable to an improbable state does not happen equally often as the opposite transition should be sufficiently explained by the assumption of a very improbable initial state of the whole universe surrounding us. And how did he arrive at that? Well, he, there, of course, he from the statistical foundation of... Um, of thermodynamics, you know, that there are fluctuations always, no? But they are small. I mean, that entropy can locally reduce and then become bigger. So, but if you have um, an eternally existing universe, you have enough time for, the, for whatever you want because it's eternal. So there can be a gigantic fluctuation that of the region you say you see around us, and this for Boltzmann was the Milky Way, um, you have a fluctuation of... of uh, or, I mean, a region of the size of the Milky Way, so you have a fluctuation um, of low entropy there from where then the entropy increases and gives rise to the second law and our world. Um, of course, later we have the bang, <laughs> which is uh, make, makes things simpler, in fact, because uh, we know the world is only 10 to the 10 years old. And if you have an initial condition 10 to the 10 years ago, uh, then it's clear that we have this increase of entropy. Um, but before I go more into that, let me talk a bit about the black holes. Black holes is the uh, opposite, in a sense, of uh, the expanding universe because it's an extreme collapse of objects to, um, yeah, out of space time, in a sense, to singularity with a horizon. And uh, perhaps you know that entropy, uh, that, that black holes classically are black. I mean, nothing comes out. Um, they do not radiate, but quantum mechanically, this is what Stephen Hawking um, found, and what I also explain more detail tomorrow in the talk on black holes. Um, the black holes do radiate with a temperature proportional to Planck's constant, and they also have then an entropy if they have a temperature. There's a TDS, term, and that's a famous formula due to Begenstein and Hawking. You can also call this black hole or Begenstein Hawking that is uh, proportional to the uh, area of the event horizon, the speed of light, the Planck's constant, and the gravitational constant, okay, Boltzmann constant. For Schwarzschild black hole, this is a spherically symmetric black hole. This is the simple formula, mass squared over solar mass squared, um, and giving this huge number, 10 to the 77. So here I will not further go into that because this is tomorrow's uh, talk, but uh, certainly I have to mention it, that here also we lack so far a statistical <laughs> interpretation of this. Well, there are many suggestions, the microscopy explanation, John Wheeler has given us this picture of it from bit, so you, so you have this uh, elementary surfaces on the black hole horizon, Planck scale square that you, where you put zeros and ones and then you count of the many the pattern permutations that you have and this should give the a over four but fundamentally you think that a quantum theory of gravity should explain us because um as in in um the usual statistical foundation of of uh, thermodynamics you know that we need quantum theory fundamentally because it's we know don't have classical balls describing molecules and also here we expect that you see here are all the fundamental quantum gravity, um, or special relativity, and quantum theory. So, yeah, so if you think about the initial condition of the universe with low entropy, 
And uh, the question, of course, arises, how likely is our today's universe? How, how low really is the universe, the entropy compared to the maximally possible entropy? Now, Roger Penrose once gave him an interesting calculation in 1981. So he considers the entropy of the observed part of the universe, um, independent of whether the universe is bigger, the observed part, the particle horizon in cosmology, is maximal if all this mass is in one black hole using this using this formula. No, based on this formula. Um, oops, no, I'm yeah. So then the probability for our universe would be the following. I have here an updated version because now in cosmology we have um, the cosmological constant also to to consider, and we don't have just um, I mean. Uh, a non-accelerated universe. We have um, not and with, with a Schwarzschild black hole. We have so-called Schwarzschild Hitler black hole. But this is not important for, for for it. Only changes the numbers, but it's not important for the argument. So um, from Einstein's formula of 1905, no, he had this famous three papers so four, and one is on thermodynamics. So e to the s is the probability divided by e over s max. Now, what's the entropy of our universe? Now you, there are nice. Uh, papers from astrophysicists who calculate the contributions from all sources, from starlight and from from dust clouds, and they find that the most uh, important contribution from the non-gravitational side is are the CMB photons, but they are overweighted by the gravitational contributions from black holes, according to this formula from supermassive black holes. Yeah? So you have certainly seen these uh, photos from the Event Horizon Telescope. So M87 has a, has such a supermassive black hole um, with billions of solar masses, which you then have to insert. And if you have this gigantic number, then it's much bigger than any light, starlight, or CMB photons or whatever. So that's this number. So that's not yet in, this I also have here added, that, that's not yet in Penrose's estimate. He has the CMB only, which is 10 to the 88. And then the maximal one, if everything is in one black hole, then you have this 10 to the 121. Okay, these are both huge numbers. Well, this is already huge, but it's negligible compared to this number. So um, this is why you get here e to the minus 10 to the 121, which is a, a number of such smallness that you cannot imagine it, I'm sure. But it's uh, uh, bigger than zero. Well, and actually, so small that it requires an explanation. Yeah. So even if you calculate the probability that all our world, what we see in all of us, just emerged in a fluctuation, then this is a very small number. Well, including our brains with our memories, this is a very very small number. But it's still bigger than this. No? So it would be much more likely that we all emerged in a fluctuation. Than, um, than just that really evolving from the Big Bang to here. Yeah? So first to have a, an even more special state and then let it evolve to today's entropy is much more unlikely than just having the fluctuation directly. <laughs> okay, so there is an issue and I, I hope that should give at least a heuristic argument for, for the um, special initial condition of the universe. So Penrose uh, from this was motivated to um, suggest the so-called while curvature hypothesis. Now this is something for, for those who know general relativity. Uh, for those who do not, it just means that the while curvature is part of the curvature of space-time that is independent of the sources. It just depends on the initial condition and it gives the measure of the inhomogeneities. Now, uh, usually we associate entropy with a homogeneous state of gas, but in gravity is just the opposite because gravity is attractive and wants to collapse things. So gravity does not like homogeneous things. I mean, if you have a dust cloud, it wants to collapse if you have no radiation. So, um, so gravity, a low entropy state is, is a, very inhom a very homogeneous state. And this is where the wild curvature is small. And Penrose suggests that this is the case at past singularities, like the Big Bang, but not uh, for future singularities or future states. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is not an explanation. It's just a, a reformulation of the fact. And his hope was that the fundamental theory 
can somehow um, prove this, and then we are done. Well, this is only a week. We do much of that. Yeah. So this is a picture. Well, uh, at, from the days where you have where people were thinking more in terms of a recollapsing universe, not like today. And Ben Rose also had this idea of a recollapsing universe with a big crunch. So it means that the Big Bang was very smooth. So no inhomogeneities, but then entropy increases. So black hole forms and the crunch looks very inhomogeneous. Uh, so you have um, increase of while curvature here. And if you take while curvature as a measure of entropy, then you would have uh, increase of uh, entropy and the, the second law. Okay, so I have uh, okay relatively recently put for uh, generalized this to a quantum while curvature hypothesis because um, yeah our world is quantum fundamentally and um, so for example we believe that all the structure in the universe eventually can be traced back to uh, quantum fluctuations in inflation or where else and then of course uh, we have a different condition and uh, I. Um, put forward this version of the quantum states for the wire scalars describing certain modes um, that are important in, in cosmology in cosmic perturbation theory assume the form of so-called adiabatic vacuum state so this is the analog to the harmonic oscillator ground state so you cannot go beyond that yeah because quantum theory you cannot have p's and q's equal zero and absolute empty so the minimum is to have quantum field with some vacuum states this is also the, the initial conditions you have in inflationary cosmology from where you successfully calculate the power spectrum that uh, of the fluctuations that you measure in um, with the Planck satellite, for example, or WMAP satellite. Okay. Um, okay, this was meant as a motivation for quantum gravity um, to go in on it. And this is, so to speak, a more fundamental, very general motivation of why we should discuss quantum gravity by Richard Feynman, who at a famous conference in Chapel Hill on 57, came up with the Gedanken experiment, why we, we, we need quantum gravity. So this is, um, I think you know the Stern Gerlach Gedanken, well, a real experiment in quantum mechanics. So you have a beam of spin one half particles and inhomogeneous magnetic field, so spin. Um, up means counter one, spin uh, down means counter two. But if you have spin to the right, then it's a superposition of both. And Feynman imagines that this is coupled to a macroscopic object, like a ball of one centimeter diameter. So if you have this superposition here, then this would mean that if this is a connected, you have for this spin a uh, superposition of ball up and down. Um, but the ball has a measurable gravitational field, so we should also have a superposition of a gravitational field associated with it. And to describe that, I mean, you should have a, a quantum theory for the gravitational field. Feynman, in, in Feynman's own words, if you believe in quantum mechanics up to any level, then you have to believe in gravitational quantization in order to describe this experiment. It may turn out, since we have never done an experiment at this level, that it's not possible. Now, today there are there are ideas uh, to, to, to do such things in a laboratory with the superposition principle gravitational field. Um, so it may be that something is like that is realizable, but certainly not in 1957 and certainly not right now. But there's something the matter with our quantum mechanics when you have too much action, this is not too much mass well, or something. But that is the only way I can see which would keep you from the necess necessity of quantizing the gravitational field the way that I don't want to propose. Okay, you can, you could have that a violation of the superposition principle when gravity comes into play, something really revolutionary new. That's what Penrose suggests. No, he says gravity is so special um, when it comes into play. Einstein equations also nonlinear. Then there's no superposition principle. You have a collapse of the wave function and so on. But that's not what uh, Feynman wants to propose, and also it's not the case in practically all of ex existing approaches to quantum gravity. Even string theory, which is very complicated, has many dimensions and Calabi-Yau manifolds, whatever. But the quantum aspect is extremely conservative. You know, with harmonic oscillators and A and A daggers, there's no, no nothing like that here, violation of superposition principle. Um, of course, 
to have the motivation that you deal with quantum gravity is one thing to really construct such a theory is another thing and we are not yet uh, have not yet reached that goal and uh, one if not the most conservative approach is the one that okay was started by Rosenfeld and uh, by um, in, in, in Zurich in 1930 but then by Dirac and then maybe completed in a sense by Wheeler John Wheeler and Price DeWitt in the United States in the 60s. And that's the so-called yeah, canonical formalism, quantum geometrodynamics with the Wheeler DeWitt equation as a central equation. Now, here, maybe in the discussion, I can explain that equation. I don't need here the details, what this all mean. What, what you only have to recall is that it has the form of the total Hamiltonian operator of gravity plus all other things applied on a, on a quantum state that, depend, that depends on everything equals zero. So no such type term here, so no T here. And why no T is that the mistake, or we all know that there should be a T. Now, John Wheeler explains at the blackboard here what is going on. Um, so say in, in mechanics, you have a particle trajectory going part from A to B, but in quantum mechanics, there's no longer a trajectory. So you cannot imagine, say, the hydrogen atom, and the counter there is a, a classical path of the electron circling around the center. You have a wave function, and it's a, a static wave function, and so on. And if you do the same formalism for Einstein's theory, then this would correspond to space-time. You know? The succession of, of space space would, would form the space-time. But if you apply the same quantum rules, like the trajectory is gone, the space-time is gone, and only space remains. So here we are with beyond space-time. So you have, uh, as your configuration space, the space of all space, so space of all three geometries, which John Wheeler called superspace in 1968. And so, so this is here defined on superspace, which is the space of all three geometries plus plus matter space of all three not four geometries not they these three geometries they replace the q's here in quantum mechanics no? and the q's and p's together you need to form a trajectory but the q's and p's as you know from the uncertainty relation they are not precisely given and the same happens here the q's are the three geometries and the Piece is something like the Hubble parameter of classical cosmology, and you cannot give them, uh, specify them exactly at the same time. Okay, here we have um, this analogy again. It's actually from Mies Nosson and Wheeler book, but it's, we have it changed it. So, in an article with Patrick Peter from Paris on quantum cosmology and time, and so we have this with. Uh, yeah, modernized. So here we have particle names. The particle is space. Here x and b correspond to the three geometry. The trajectory is that corresponds to the four geometry space time. And uh, here we have space time as the arena. Here is super space psi of the three dimensional geometry. And here would be psi of x and t. Yeah, this absence of time here, well, this zero, it means that psi does not depend on t. So where does uh, time that we observe or believe to observe uh, comes from? Now, some people like to call it, uh, well, what it's usually called, I would say, the problem of time. I mean, and, and it's quantum version. There's also a classical version, but a quantum version means that here, the external time t has vanished from the formalism. Yeah, because there are no longer trajectories which you could use, I mean, which you could parameterize by time. Yeah, this is, uh, why, yeah. So I have done it in uh, geometrodynamics. It uh, also holds in loop one the gravity, and that's also discussed here in, in your group, which is uh, also a canonical version with different variables. But uh, you also have their constraints uh that when well, this is a concern that would translate in such equations and so so there are certainly differences between loops and geometrodynamics but concerning the problem of time i would say it's the same uh okay for string theory i would 
to maybe if you are just ask me in the discussion, that uh, it's a bit more subtle. And it also is not related to just the wheeler dvd equation. If you start with any theory that classically has no absolute time and quantize it according to these heuristic rules, then this time is gone. You know? Only if you have a classical theory with an absolute time, like Newton's theory, that you preserve. You know? This is what is done here. The Schrodinger equation, this is um, absol Newton's absolute time, T. But if classically there is everything dynamical and not absolute, then the quantization leads good to a vanishing of, um, of the T. Yeah. I should mention the wheeler dvd equation itself has also the structure of a wave equation in this sense. So um, it, it has uh, inter internally the structure of uh, in the kinetic term of minus plus 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 plus. So like uh, uh, the equation for oscillating strings on guitar and so on. So you can identify from it what is called an intrinsic time, you not know, just before the signature of the kinetic term. You know, if you have, uh, okay, you will see the equations and later transparency. This is just a side remark. Um, um, if one is interested in the interpretation of quantum mechanics, usually we have this probability interpretation in quantum mechanics and associated with the Hilbert space um, and uh, the conservation of probability in time t. Yeah. But if there's no time t, then it's not so clear what happens with that, hmm? whether we really need it. Yeah, so, okay, this is just, I mean, from a conference article, um, does not mean too much the absence of time in full quantum clarity. Yeah. So, it's still well, that's there. It's just not moving. Huh? There is no time here. But, but you still have a scalar because here I have not included this in the talk, but we have also devices for so called conformal gravity, which has no scale, and there would even be these numbers lacking. <laughs> <laughs> but at least here in Einstein's theory, it's not scale invariant. So you have some numbers, but no, no pointers going around. Okay, so in quantum cosmology, you can study these equations in simple situations because there you have quantum gravity is terribly complicated because you have infinitely many degrees of freedom in cosmology. Typically, uh, in the Friedman models, you have the size of the universe, right? And maybe some, some matter degrees of freedom. So let me consider here the closed Friedman the matter universe with a scale factor A in the usual, usual notation uh, with a massive scale of field phi, homogeneous. And uh, because there are only two of them instead of infinitely many superspace, so so Mies non 96 and I called it mini superspace, which for the when you read this for the first time, you feel a little bit perplexed, but it's a it's an old concept already, mini superspace, and you have the space time diagram uh, metric minus n squared t squared plus a squared, and yeah, the metric of the three space. And in this, with a certain choice of unit, the Wheeler DVD equation has this form. Uh, so there's a kinetic term with respect to the scale factor one with respect to the field, and you have a potential term that mixes the two. And the psi does not depend on t, but it depends on a and phi. And you see here that it has the structure of a d'Alembert. So here's a minus and a plus. So it's what we call an oscillation equation or hyperbolic equation. And this is why you can formulate initial value problem with respect to one of these variables. Well, if you had other variables, other matter, because I mean, they would all come with a minus, so it's the A, in fact, that has this distinguished sign. You don't see it in two dimensions, but you see it in other dimensions. And this gives rise to an important concept of uh, time. Maybe this is a very important slide. Conceptually, yeah, you don't need to understand much mathematics. In the classical theory for recollapsing universe in configuration space, just the A5 space, you have here the units described as this trajectory expanding, having maximum and recollapse. If you have a recollapsing universe, as is the case here, a big bang and big crunch, but this is not, there's no absolute direction. So you could also have it here from here. This is an unparameterized trajectory, but you could, for example, have initial conditions here. And then in, if, if you do that, then this is certainly the deterministic successor of this expanding part. You see it on the computer, yeah, it goes here and here. And this is how you do the solve the classical equations. Yeah? You have a parameter t that you can introduce. And now, 
but not so in the quantum sea because time is absent and uh, and this trajectory is absent. So if you want to construct wave packets that follow this, like a narrow tube, this is what you often do want in mechanics, then um, you cannot put it here and follow it here because you have no, no T, right? You have to put initial conditions here because this is what you do with a wave equation at A equals constant. And then you must put both parts of the wave packet here as initial conditions. Yeah. So which means that both Big Bang and Big Crunch, in a sense, are the same footing in the quantum theory because there is no T that could distinguish them. And the recollapsing wave packet must be present initially in this meaning. So no intrinsic difference between Big Bang and Big Crunch. And this is what you have to consider in, in concrete examples. So here there's an old example, I okay, already 1990. Um, so-called indefinite oscillator that you get by coupling certain fields in the, in a Friedman universe. So it's a harmonic, two harmonic oscillator, but with indefinite signs. No? So with the usual harmonic oscillator, you have your minus, minus, plus, plus. And here you have here a plus and here a minus. So if you want to, so classically, the solutions of this model are in a chi space, so called ellipses, these are true ellipses, as you know from oscillographs and so on. Um, well, here, and then when calculating wave packets, you must put initial conditions here on A equals constant. You must put this here and this here to get really something that follows here a superposition of two ellipses. If you did not do that, if you say, no, I just put it here, then you get a solution that's just spread out. You don't see any tube, so it's just a, a, a fully quantum solution. So this, I mean, is important. No? So you see here really the difference of time or of determinism in the quantum and the classical theory. And this is very general. I mean, this is based on wheeler bit equation, but it, it comes just from, from this form here. Yeah. Okay, but then you say maybe um, maybe you are very skeptic uh, so, but I mean, to reduce the skepticism, of course, I have to show you how the standard time say in the in the in Einstein's equations or this time here it actually reemerges from that uh, timeless equation. And I have not included technicalities on that. Um, what you can do is something similar to what you do in, in molecular physics. So what we discussed earlier today, so-called von Oppenheimer type of expansion that you have, I mean, gravity and you have other fields and they behave differently. Gravity is distinguished by a certain scale that we call the Planck scale, um, the Planck mass that is much bigger than other masses. And if you do a calculation that is based on that difference, then you can find um, a solu approximate solution of this that um, brings in a T. I mean, you have here, if this is of the form approximately some e to the i s over h bar t, which only depends on geometry uh, on the three metric, and you have something else that depends on a to the phi, then you can find here, um, okay. Approximately the Schrödinger equation, where this i comes from this i here, and the dt comes from uh, just this nabla s nabla is d over dt. No. But this are, requires a special state, right? This is not something you get generally. Uh, it's a, it's a bit similar to the derivation of geometric optics from wave optics. Now, so the concept of light rays is certainly an approximate notion, but you can derive it from the wave object, optics. And this is the same here. Now, the same limit where you can, formal limit where you can derive light rays. Um, you can derive here, again, this time here. And space time, again, is done. So we are not longer than beyond space time. So we are in, in space time. OK, so we have here. So to speak, the pointer again in this approximation. 
but it comes not from a Newton absolute time that is there always. I mean, God given, it comes from within the configuration space. As the light rays come from the wave optics, they also come not from from heaven. Um, yeah. So what? Ha so the coherence I mentioned already, and that this also refers now to old work by by T and myself. Um, what happens to the quantum superposition? Huh? This is a special state and. You can superpose whatever you like, like you can superpose Schrodinger's cat. And uh, yeah, and then you cannot derive this here. So in quantum cosmology, arbitrary superpositions of the gravitational field and matter states can occur. So how can we understand the emergence of an approximate classical universe? And the answer is decoherence. And um, I don't want to bother you with technical details. Maybe I, I have this slide here, this only slide. So for decoherence, you must um, divide up the full system into a relevant part, which I call system, and an irrelevant part I call environment. And so the idea that C had in 86 was system is the global degrees of freedom, like the size of the universe and the environment are small density fluctuations or small tiny gravitational waves that you don't see here. And so I did then the uh, calculations, I mean, uh, following this idea. And uh, in fact, yeah, you can then understand how these superpositions decohere and that you can somehow justify to have such states. Because say, if you have here the, the complex conjugate, you add, well, you add other things, they become independent. Okay, here, this is an example, decoherence by gravitons. As the environment, you don't observe them, so they are irrelevant degrees of freedom, but they are still there. And uh, for those of you who know uh, this formalism, um, the reduced density matrix becomes di diagonalized. Yeah. So for those who don't know this formalism, I just uh, I want to emphasize that this weird superposition, such as Schrödinger cat, that you also have in quantum gravity, you can understand how they disappear. Hmm? Maybe this I skip. Um, you can also do this then for this prime model of quantum fluctuations. When during the inflationary phase, if you believe in inflationary cosmology that the universe underwent a very rapid uh, exponential expansion, um, then there are quantum fluctuations out of which the classical fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background emerge. And uh, you can only understand, I mean, uh, how this classical comes from the quantum fluctuation if you invoke the process of decoherence, you know? uh, which uh, also we discussed with David Pulaski and Alexei Starobinsky. Um, and there are many technical things involved. What is the preferred basis for that? Uh, what is, I mean, in the PQ space, what is the classical property and so on? And But this can be discussed based on these models of inflation, which you can debate, of course, but which is a very popular model in, in modern cosmology. Now, so which means that things like this, so this, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope, so the galaxy structure, they emerge from quantum fluctuations, but you need this decoherence process you know, so that you see classical stochastic distribution instead of quantum stochastic distribution, which has superpositions and, and weird quantum states. Yeah, so finally, that should also come to an end, I think, at some point. Um, and uh, the error of time. Now, maybe you have lost the track. So we started with this problem of the error of time. Then I came to the conclusion that we need a special conditions in cosmology. So we know uh, need gravity, but initial conditions in cosmology, we have to refer to quantum gravity as the more fundamental theory. And so can we really solve this problem from, from say, having this wheeler witt equations? Well, I would not claim that the problem has solved, but uh, it's, at least I would say it's clear how the problem can be solved. And if you write down the wheeler witt equation here, it's a bit more detailed. So alpha is the logarithm of the scale factor. So this looks simpler. And this symbolically stands for all non-gravitational degrees of freedom. And the point is you have here a potential that couples alpha to all other degrees of freedom, but this vanishes for alpha to minus infinity is A going to zero, is big bang. 
Yeah. So which means that uh, near the what big bang is we would have, we don't we don't have this part. We have a free wave equation, and so this is compatible with a simple boundary condition where you where the, the full state is just a product state. Product state means there's no entanglement. No entanglement means that if you trace out or integrate out some degrees of freedom, it does not make anything. You know, because here, if you just integrate this out, then this is still there, a pure state. So the idea is that um, there's an entanglement entropy that increases with increasing size of the universe. Coming from a simple boundary condition to the real degree. Because here, with respect to this intrinsic time alpha, this equation is asymmetric. You know, it looks simple for the Big Bang. It looks complicated for bigger. So here, for the first time, you have some asymmetry in a fundamental equation that could give you this asymmetry in time. Of course, you have then to go from the alpha in this way to the t. This has not yet been uh, spelled out in detail. But it should be possible. I mean, this is this exact relation with the thermodynamic entropy. So entanglement entropy, okay, but you won't also have the usual thermodynamic entropy, which has to be discussed. Okay, this would then define the direction of time. It also would implement this uh, quantum wild tensor hypothesis. But then the question arises: the expansion of the universal tautology, because it just you just define the direction of time from having from going from smaller size to bigger size, right? That defines the time. So it's not that the universe expands in time. Yeah, so time is given by uh, the increasing entropy, and this relates small universes to bigger universes. No? So, so um, you would never have a, a recollapsing universe, for example, if this is correct. No? So here you have again Penrose's picture, as I explained earlier, and we had discussed, uh, okay, in 95, this recollapsing quantum universe where Big Bang and Big Crunch are treated symmetrically. So if, if there you have a smooth universe, also the Big Crunch is smooth, and you would have, a, and the universe collapses formally, having um, a reversal of the error of time. But this you cannot observe, if you, even if you lift here, it would not be that uh, your tea, your cup of tea, would be uh, suddenly hotter than colder because this turns out to be a fully quantum region that you could not survive as a classical observer. So everything is consistent. I don't claim that this is uh, the real picture of our world, of course. I mean, then we come maybe to the also philosophy aspects. What I claim is that if you believe to such an equation, then it's a consequence. Hmm? And this is, of course, an equation of quantum gravity that has not yet been tested as we usually test other equations. So if you doubt that picture, I would uh, say means that you doubt the formalism because once you adapt, accept that, then it's a matter of solving equations and uh, it's it's hard to doubt that. Yeah. But that's what we often do in physics. And we have some maybe tentative, some formalism and from that formalism we derive maybe some tentative picture of the world. That maybe at the end turn out to be correct, or that may or maybe false. Okay, so John Wheeler, who has always very precise statements, um, in '68 with the real DVD equation, he wrote these considerations reveal that the concepts of space time and time itself are not primary, but secondary ideas in the structure of physical theory. So you see, I mean, this equation is already quite old. These concepts are valid in the classical approximation, however, they have neither meaning application under circumstances and quantum geometrodynamic effects become important. There is no space-time, no? so we are beyond space-time. There is no time, there is no before, there is no after. The question was having nexus without meaning. At a fundamental level, of course, at the semi classic you, know, you all have some plans for what you do tonight. So, of course, we go for dinner, and so we are hungry, but uh, that's the uh, not the fundamental level, right? That's our effective level. Or phenomenological level. So, Price the Witt once wrote, one learns a time, and how really are both phenomenological concepts. No? So, of course, there are real concepts, but uh, maybe also in the level of you, I would like to see maybe at the level of the semantic and um, uh, and syntactical relationships, how you would how, how you would describe that relation. No? 
the fundamental one. And okay, so I'm done. Here's some literature, okay, for myself, but of course, there you find also references to many other people here from the textbook and maybe this recent article that is open access also on the archive with Patrick Peter and this one on the quantum wire curvature hypothesis. So I thank you for your attention, your patience, and uh, of course, invite also questions. Thank you very much. So I think we need to disconnect the microphone again. Yeah. So she has the first question. So this, okay, I give to you. Thank but this you. I keep here. Uh, oh, no, I'll just give back this to you and then you can also okay. drink into this. I was really excited about this talk because I actually did a project on the cosmological era of time and have followed some of your work. So now I'm really dying to ask you a question that I've had for quite some time. And uh, I, I actually have two somewhat related questions, but I'll start with the first one. So if I understood correctly, we have a parameter with which we can define time, which is the, uh, the scale. And what we're doing is we're ultimately fixing one special boundary condition, but then the dynamics of the Wheeler-Witt equation basically and the demand for global symmetry simultaneously fixes another boundary condition. And therefore we have this gold universe. Right. And that's what we just did. Exactly. So my question is, are we really doing something different from what we've done in the past, where we've defined the direction of time as the direction away from, you know, a special boundary condition, the initial condition, and that is the master arrow of time. And all of these other arrows, whether they're entropic or electromagnetic or entanglement or, you know, what have you, they all, you know, emerge by stipulating a special boundary condition and the direction away from that is, you know, you know, the anchor by which we're comparing these other arrows. So are you doing something fundamentally different? Because it seems to oh, me like say, uh, thanks for the concrete equation because um what well, yeah, well, without that this kind of equations do you have an equation that are symmetric right with respect to this. And you do not. So here you have a equation that looks here differently than it looks here. So it somehow suggests to you to have such a simple boundary concept. But I would say it's a realization, maybe even if you like of what is one's own idea. Right. Um, having having a particular boundary concept. Because how at least I cannot imagine of any other way to explain the error of So I would answer yes, but um really have and it is shown this to work, not just at the level of an idea. Okay. And then I have a follow up, if that's all right. So, does this also work when we take into account the counteracting, um, attractive gravitational force depending on the matter density? in the universe, because I thought that was one of the main objections to Gold's initial proposal, which was to tie the direction of time to the expansion of the universe. Well, Goldsman did not talk about the expansion of the universe. He mentioned a static universe. I mean, Thomas Gold. Ah, Gold. Gold, Gold, yeah. Thomas um, Gold, yes. Um, he also had this uh, version no, of the error of time. Right. And, uh, this, I would say that the formation of structure and uh, this formation of that was the uh, same manifestation of this low entropy in the condition. I mean, if you have these pictures, right? So uh, you see here, 
Central A, you have a smooth big bang, and so entropy increases here, and this of course includes the increase of gravitational entropy. And increase of gravitational entropy is of course the condensation of objects. Um, in the extreme case, the black hole is the black hole entropy, but also the stars and finally stars. White holes of neutral stars, and even they include our future, maybe from the collapse of the vectors, whatever. Now, so there you have this increase of entropy. So, I would not say that uh, that there is a conflict with the sense of Thomas Gold, which was in the 50s, and here is the black hole, which was unknown then. It's uh, no longer. So, the arrow of time both leads to this picture of the expanding universe because it has small a. A, but also to this increase of gravitational entropy for, for structures. This was the same master apple plan that gives you all these other aspects. I'm listening so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I ask the people who ask the questions to please return this once you've asked ah, the question so yeah. that you can speak okay, into the. We did, but well, we yeah, hope the recording will be clear enough. Nick has to make an action. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm especially happy since it's touching on many things I've been thinking about. In fact, a number of things I've been talking about with different people today, even. So, um, thank you. Uh, in a way, my question is quite related to searches, although. I'm not sure my question is quite sort of well formulated. In a way, it's just an invitation to say a bit more about uh, deco how decoherence is going here. So here's sort of a concern. So uh, here's sort of a concern that, in fact, I was telling you about the paper by Craig Callender and Eugene Chua. They bring this up as well. So you might think so. And you want the entanglement to sort of is going to be increasing in this system, and you need you need decoherence to be happening in this story. But you've here, I've already said, you know, it's happening, it's increasing. So it sounds it, as if I've already got the time before yeah, I have the deco before I have the decoherence. Yeah. yeah, so can you say a bit more sort of, I guess, sort of formally to see that that's just an artifact of the language? How How, how is how is, how is it all safe? Yeah. And But before you do, let me pass the mic. Let me pass the microphone to you before you. Yeah, yeah. That's the, physical aspect. Aspect. the language aspects, of course, come yeah, from yeah. our effective yeah. classical world. That's clear. Because in our evolution no, from, from apes, and so we did not need that. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. Yeah. No, no survival advantage, no, with knowing that. So, yeah, so, so, see everything's okay. so, 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 um, the, the, for, the fundamental side is just this relation from smaller to bigger A, but nothing happens at this. It's still the static wave function. But when then you go to this, semi classical limit where this approximate T emerges, then this T, okay, there's of course mathematic behind all of that, is then related to the A if there is a T uh, semi classically. And this would correspond to our then the, the, the everyday language. This would then be the T in the Einstein equations and, and this T here in the Schrodinger equation. So in that limit where we have a T as an approximate concept, then that T corresponds to that uh, increase, I mean, to that scale factor. And then we can talk about the expansion of the universe and the increase of entropy and something happening. But okay, still something happening may be an illusion if you go to this fundamental level, even if we are, of course, uh, strong believers in that something happens. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, the ma fundamental mathematical side is about timeless wave function, but it has these scale factors and you can have an entropy and whatever. But this um, limit here gives you a T. And if you have this limit and, okay, there's still this, um, um, oops, yeah, this issue then here, how to re relate the entanglement entropy precisely with the thermodynamic entropy. Uh, if this were successfully done, then I think we would be finished probably. 
So am I clear or am I saying just too many words and nothing becomes clear? I mean, you have the, the equations and uh, then you relate this to the semi-classical limit. And this is where our language then applies with the usual picture of uh, expanding and so on. You don't seem convinced. Well, that's what I kind of uh, sort of imagined. Uh, and I guess I'm still unclear in the story and don't have to answer this, but why I'm not sort of smiling happily is I don't quite, I still not quite clear where the, the, the sort of entang where the decoherence part of the story has to kind of has to enter into the the recovery of time. Uh, okay. Enters uh, in a sense automatically because the coherence, when you read uh, is the process where you start with some, um, you start with such a special state, no, where where you have no coherence, you have no entropy. Then, because if you increase here the alpha, this becomes entangled, and if you trace out an well, irrelevant for degrees of freedom, then you automatically automatically get decoherence. It's not that decoherence is somehow put in or so. The only thing is this equation here and a simple boundary condition, and the rest is provided by the formalism and by by the person who does the calculation and so on. No, so that's so true. that's that, that, okay. so there's no no input of decoherence and no input. It's just the boundary condition of low entropy together with this equation, and the, the rest is then. Derived. And find the entanglement and yeah, yeah, this is right, right. This is what you then derive from. This is no, no, no further input is done. I have a follow up question on that. Uh, if I understood it correctly, the Boltzmannian aspect of this program is really that you, this is a boundary condition which is not merely compatible with uh, the. The, the dynamical equation, but you stipulate it, you put it there, yes, and yes, that's yes. really what's do, doing the work here. That's what gives you the asymmetry. Yeah, yes, right? that okay, you can still say that's an input. Of course, it's an input. I can put here an initial condition that looks very unnatural, but the point is it's not put here at only one value of alpha. It's in, in that limit when you approach the Big Bang, this becomes unentangled. No? And so this here in my, um, of course, I did not, did not put everything here in the talk, but this would then here at the beginning be this um, this harmonic oscillator ground state from the quantum while tensor architecture, of course. No? Yes. So whether, I mean, David, maybe he in his paper, he said that once we understand the mathematics of the full equation, he speculated then perhaps we will not have a we will only may have one choice for a mathematically sensible boundary condition or something. And that I don't know here, right? So I don't want to claim that the problem is solved, but I think it's put on a clear footing somehow at, yeah. at the level of equations. One thing we could have done is we could have from a boundary condition at the other end, sort of as alpha goes to plus infinity. Yeah. So that, that would be somewhat that, on that 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 here. Yeah, yeah. But then, okay, you have a boundary condition, but then you have here, uh, I mean, of course, a strong interaction between all degrees of freedom. So if you have just that particular value, some some condition, you can calculate backwards. But it would not be like that. It would maybe, but at one alpha, you have one maybe unattended state, then immediately it would get entangled. Uh, because of that interaction here. I mean, the point is that here you you have if you if you go back in in, in alpha time, you see uh, a, a slow transition to an unentangled world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of that this, is, yeah, because of that. Yeah, so yes. this condition is an gives an asymmetry. Yeah. But of course, you are free mathematically um, to have this. Um, so you see, always somehow naturalness also enters in into arguments. Also, you're looking at models where the alpha doesn't is bounded, right? It's, um, well, no, I, I look into this. Uh, well, in this earlier work, um, had the, the recollapsing universe, right? Where is yeah. it? Somewhere it is. Yeah. So here. Yeah, classically, maybe you have this, yeah. and there we have also a final condition. So we have. 
final condition that, so this is also in alpha is the logarithm of A. So for A to infinity has to go to zero because otherwise you will not get the classical limit of a recollapsing unit. We better exponentially the growing pieces of psi in classically forbidden regions. That's not what we have in quantum mechanics. So, so that also is used, right, together with this. And this gives them these wave packets that we also discussed today. Sorry, but if you have another follow up question, <laughs> I may, on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide here. So, so this term here, it would be the case that this goes to zero for alpha going to plus. No, 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 it doesn't go. It has typically <laughs> such terms. Um, for example, if you cover to, to a scalar field, there's uh, something like even strong coupling. You know, so you have an E to be as alpha. Yeah, I see. No? And uh, so, so it should be A to the C. So the strong coupling to the scale factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this, this becomes more and more important. Of course, you can add one particular alpha and you can make an initial condition whatever you want, right? Mm -hmm. But then, mm -hmm. in a sense, if you go back that instantaneously, you would have a very large entropy. Mm -hmm. And um, so you could have that, but it's not natural, I would say. It is this boundary condition, which, however, is natural given this. Yes, yeah, 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 right. Okay. Given this, and this is, yeah, it's symmetry that is fundamentally okay. there. Good. Yeah, and this suggests to go here and that and not to the large A. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think now it's but this turn. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, no worries. Thanks a lot. Uh, I guess it's just. Clarification. I'm going to try. I'm basically going to say what I understood and ask you whether it's um, roughly close to what you, the main point of what you said. So uh, I was really thinking about the uh, special conditions at the beginning of the universe, right? So say we are living on emerging space time and we want to know why those initial conditions are, are so special, why the entropy uh, is so low there. And then we move to a more fundamental description uh, with, with this super space. And um, what's the next? Are you are you saying that uh, the explanation for the special conditions they correspond in the more fundamental description with the super space to, to kind of um, they're more natural in this description and they arise because at the descriptive, uh, sorry, at the emerging level, when we say it's special, we mean like there were many other options. So why is it the case that we are living in this, those specific solutions of the equations? Are you saying that when we move to the more fundamental description, it's more natural in the sense that most solutions will lead to, a, to what we perceive in the less fundamental description as uh, a low entropy at the beginning of the universe? Something like that, or is it not that at all? I don't understand correctly, so for me, if I did not, um, I mean, of course, uh, in the space of all solutions, I mean, most solutions, they, they are just timeless, mm -hmm. non-classical. So but there are regions in super space where you have this uh, semi-classical limit and where you can have a superposition of wave packets that decohere hear from each other. And if you are there, right, and we have here such a bound, then you would dare see this correlation. But of course, most of super space is very dull. <laughs> I mean, there's just nothing going on, right? This is um, but also classic, classically already. I mean, why we have these approximate Friedman universes with expanding universe. I mean, Einstein equations, allows many more solutions, the Gödel cosmos or whatever, which we don't see. No? So, so in, this, in, in the space of all mathematical solutions, the observed world is something very particular, I would say, all the time. You know? But, uh, yeah. If we are the right location to super space, the one that is interesting and leads to space time, yeah. you get for free, sorry, you get for free an explanation yeah. Uh, of of why the conditions are uh, special. So to speak, that we really based on an experimental creation. Yes, yes, I would say yes. That's the at least the ambition. Right. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah, that that's the ambition of right. of um, okay. Whether this survives, say in the future, and whether we can test it, is another story. But 
I mean, we have to take equations seriously. That is what I mean. Is this? Sorry, in some form, it's just the other, the same. So the equation you, ha you have up there, so I'm now just sort of going to think of that as a sort of time independent Schrodinger equation. Again, the equation you have at the top. Yes. So, th sorry, I know this is what it says, but I, I'm just, I'm, it's, I'm just sort of surprised. There's really no solutions of that. So, if it was just forget the sum, so it's just, so we just have wave function. So, psi is just a function of alpha and yeah. x. There's really no solutions to that as a as an equation where they factor, where it factorizes. I'm not sure about that. So if you have here this equation and you ask for the solutions. So there's really no solutions where it just is a product of wave functions of alpha and of x. Well, there are. If, if this in the, well, I mean, if the potential is there. Yeah. Then of course, there, uh, there is no solution that, that, um, that factorizes, yes. If the potential is there, but only the limit where, where you have a free wave equation. Yeah. Free wave equation. Um, you have to know, so don't know where a equals zero. Okay. Yeah, and there's no solution. Well, at one I mean, I can see if this was a time dependent equation so that they were in interacting, they would become entangled. Okay, I guess this, this is just the. Yeah, yeah. and there's no fact. Of course, this is question at one value of alpha, of course, you can. Have an initial, you're free to have an initial function that won't value, but then but as soon as I have this, so this is just a kind of elementary fact about differential equations in multivariables, really, that I somehow failed to remember or learn in my undergraduate yeah, classes. Okay, exact uh, really factorizing to to have here, yeah, the non trivial. Of course, there are some trivial things, sure, some if some. Special. Like something kind energy. of special. Yeah, Okay, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Saksh, you had another question, right? <laughs> so this is a follow-up to Baptiste's question. If we conceptualize low entropy as you know, a measure of say phase space volume among all the possible uh, boundary conditions and let's for simplicity, just say initial conditions, then what you're saying is that this boundary condition for which we get, you know, a scale factor of zero to start with and then it yeah. grows at least in our effective language is still a very low volume region of the phase space of all solutions. Okay, so if we- Phase space is something classical. Right, yeah. like the state space, yeah, yeah. whatever. Right, okay. And so if, I mean, I'm not saying this move is necessarily the right one, but if we say that low entropy and special boundary condition, they're synonymous, then this would also be a special boundary condition that we have to impose by hand. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. No, thank you I so I think we've come to the end of this uh, so please join me in thanking Klaus once again. Yeah, thank you very much.